75,000 people flocked to Ohio Stadium to watch Ohio State's spring game. There were some highlights, some lowlights, and there was a play by some players that made you scratch your head wondering if this is what we will see during the upcoming season. We have a fun recap of Ohio State's spring game during today's episode of Locked on Buckeyes. You are Locked on Buckeyes, your daily podcast on the Ohio State Buckeyes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, Buckeye fans? Welcome back to another episode of Locked On Buckeyes for the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jay Stevens, also the host of the Jay Stevens Podcast. It is Monday, April 17th in the year 2023, and this episode is brought to us by our good friends at FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. During today's episode, you see him on your screen. If you're watching the YouTube, it is our guy, Mo Murphy, at Mo underscore Cheese 15 on the Twitter. My guy, Mo Murphy, is back, and I was trying to get someone on to talk about the spring game after watching Kyle McCord, after watching Sonny Styles, after watching CJ Hicks, and my guy, Mo Murphy, is a perfect person for that. Mo, welcome back to Locked on Buck Guys. Hey. First off, I'm glad to be back on Locked on Buckeyes, and I'm not going to lie. When you hit me up to get on here, I was super excited. I watched the spring game. You attended the spring game. I don't think the feeling is mutual at this point after watching what we watched yesterday. Yeah, man, it was a uh, it was a fun game to be at. Let me, just, let me just put that out there. I was at the spring game. My, uh, my fiancé and I went to the spring game, and it was fun. We were down in uh, the lower section, got row 10, 10 rows up from the field. Very fun, very fun experience. Got to get a closer view to the players. Uh, Trey Deion Henderson, Dallin Aiden, Mayan Williams, they warmed up literally right in front of where we were, where we were sitting. So it's great. You got O-line to our left. Across the way, you got the receivers and quarterbacks warming up. At the other end of the field, you got the D-ends and the linebackers. And the D- I mean, it was a good experience. What was not always the best experience during my attendance of the spring game was some of the things we saw from Ohio State's offense. At the same time, though, there were some things from the Ohio State defense with the first unit that we saw, ooh, those are building blocks. There were some guys in the secondary in the second unit that I said, ooh, that guy could start. So the whole thing, like, Mo's mood changing from hit me hitting him up to talk about this on today's show – to after watching it is great. I mean, it's, it's one thing. There's also that same thing, like, I watched some offense, okay. I watched some offense, not okay. The defense is promising. So, Mo, like, you have a little changing of the mood after watching the spring game for me when I hit you up. Myself, I can go positive with some things. I can go negative. I can say it's literally TBD to be determined because, like I mentioned pre-show, Mo, this is April 5th. It was April 15th. We're in the middle of May, I'm excuse me, middle of April. And so there's a lot of time between now and week one. So I'm not trying to put too much stock into what we saw, but also, Mo, you need to put stock into what we saw because there are certain parts of this team that need a lot of work. Yeah, and I'm with you, Jay. So <clears throat> the, the advantage that I had while watching the game on TV was I got to hear the, you know, the, the commentary. Yes. And I I don't know what it was like at the spring game, but as far as like hearing the commentary, everybody was kind of concerned as far as how plain the offense looked. And when they when they announced that and they were talking about it, I'm like, well, Ryan Day is not going to just give everybody a real sneak peek into how elite the offense can be, because I looked at the skill positions everywhere, DBs, wide receivers, safeties, all that. And I'm like, we're really good everywhere. I just walked away and I'm like, is quarterback a cause for concern? But we're just revisiting the same situation that we were in two years ago when we didn't know who our quarterback was going to be out of Kyle McCord, the freshman, and CJ Stroud. So I'm not too, too concerned for the simple fact like we were here two years ago and you seen like you can say what you want about CJ Stroud. You can say what you want about these past two years. But I mean, I think it turned into 
ultimate success outside of beating Michigan and winning a national championship, but you can't tell me that the product on the field offensively wasn't elite. We were one of the best offenses, period. And with the same questions two years ago, adding C with C.J. Stroud. You know, it's very similar to that offseason to where there was a, somewhat of a quarterback competition during that year, but people pretty much thought and believed mm -hmm. it was Stroud over Jack Miller during that offseason. This is more of a true competition. We didn't get to see the other quarterback that's in the running to be the starter in Devin Brown due to an injury that he suffered out of procedure that Ryan Day announced the Wednesday prior to the spring game. And so I'm sitting here in the moment like, I'm happy it's April. Don't get me wrong, Mo. I'm happy. I'm also like not excited or happy or um, overjoyed with what we saw from a court. He had some good moments. We saw he still has chemistry with his former high school teammate, Marvin Harrison Jr. We saw him have connections with other players. But I'm happy it's April. But also, thinking of quarterback competition, since that's the talk of the town, you didn't get to see the other quarterback who's in the running to start this year. And that's one of the things I talk about cause for, for concern. I don't know if there's a cause for concern. Like, I, I literally don't know. Maybe QB1 was on the sidelines and not playing due to an injury. Like, I don't know what's where, which way Ryan Day's leaning. All I know is if it's Kyle McCord, I, I'm comfortable. We, we saw some good things on Saturday. I'm comfortable with what I saw. Not so much concerned. Only because only. There's a lot of time between now and week one of the season. That's the only reason, Mo. Yeah, I mean, Kyle McCord had he, – he threw some passes, and I know – and you would know better than me, but, you know, me keeping up with Ohio State is like he looked good throughout times of spring practice. Mm -hmm. In the scrimmage, he made some darts. Like, we, we were able to see the, the, the film of his great throws. Obviously, nobody's going to put his bad throws, but – at the end of the day, like, even he dropped a dime to Carnell Tate. And yeah. I'm like, okay. Like, when I seen that pass, I'm like, there's not a lot of quarterbacks that can make that pass. But at the same time, like, they also show what his stats were after throwing that touchdown. He was 17-32, to 180 yards, and that was his first touchdown pass thrown. Yeah. Ohio State is used to a high-powered offense. And so, people, and, and, and like I said, the commentators were bringing up, like, oh, this – this offense isn't that creative or this or that. I'm not that aspect. I'm not worried about because like my thing is, and, and I'll pass it to you. Do we really expect Ryan day to show you what the offense could possibly look like in September, October, November, and December in April? Like that's right. the biggest question. Right. Like I don't really expect him to put us in that predicament where we're like, yeah, this is what we're coming in next year. As far as, all the playmakers we have. So that, that was my biggest thing was that would be my pushback on what the commentator said is like, at the same time, I don't expect Ryan day to open up the playbook in April, knowing that we got games in September, October, November, and December. I'm also going to keep it in context here, Mo. And also I will agree with that as well. Um, you're not going to see not just Ohio state's offense, any offense really right this time of year, yeah. be full throttle, hundred percent, open everything up, um, throwing in the kitchen sink just because you just want to go. No one's really going to do that right now. Just keep that in context. Also, Ryan Day might not call plays in the fall. It could be Brian Hartline. So my thought, we could see some four wide receiver sets. We could see um, different things, different wrinkles that we don't normally see. As mm -hmm. I do believe Jaden Ballard is a piece of the pie that Brian Hartline might want to use with the Buka, Harrison Jr., and Fleming. So if you get four wide with that unit, like, just, I I'm here for it. I am here for it. But I also want to keep it in context, Mo. Sticking on the subject of the offense, these offensive line needs a lot of work. A lot of inconsistent play might be the word to, or phrase to use from the offensive line. Um, left tackle, John, these are starting off with the linemen for the game, uh, the spring game on Saturday. Left tackle, Joshua Fryer. Left guard, Donovan Jackson. Center, Carson Hensman. Right guard, Matt Jones. And then right tackle, Zen Mikulski. Now, Mikulski and Tegra Tishabola were back, were rotating at right tackle with the first unit. Mm -hmm. I will keep it in context this way. I mentioned this. I'm happy it's April for Kyle McCord. I think Kyle, Kyle McCord is going to be a good college quarterback. I, I believe he's going to be a good one. And I just believe he's – honestly, it's just getting some more reps. You've been podcasting, hosting your own podcast. You, Mo, the host, uh, episode 8, 9, 10, are completely different than episode 100, 101, 102. So I do believe when it comes to Kyle McCord, don't put much stock and say that's the quarterback we're going to see in the fall. 
realize game one, game two, game three, if he ends up starting in the, in the season, will be different than game eight, nine, ten. So let's keep that in context. More context, though, when it comes to the O-line, there are three new starters on that O-line. Going up against J.J. Toy Maloa, Jack Sawyer, Mike Hall, Tyleek Williams. You kind of get the gist, like, these got Caden Curry. These mm-hmm. guys are really good. And a defense that's really good and playing that position, working to get working to get better all offseason, it's easier for a D end and to allow out to attack Josh Fryer every single play. Because Josh one, he's learning a new position at left tackle, different footwork, different hand placement. He's yep. working with the guy to his right that he didn't work with last year. So the old line having three new starters out of possible five starters on that old line is something to watch. And I think as we get into fall camp in the fall, getting into August, we're going to see more about what the offensive line is going to be, if this is the starting five, and how they'll they protect Kyle McCord. Because I'll say this and turn it back over to you, Mo. If they block a little bit better for Kyle McCord, it, we see it. We'll, I think the conversation you and I have is a little bit different as far as the analysis of McCord's play. So I'm not going to put all that on him. And the fact that they just put a hand on him, he's down. I think there's a lot of stuff that goes into why McCord's play is being being viewed the way that it is. O line needs work. Also, you only have one of your three starting receivers, so that's more context as far as the offense. Like y'all can people can get on Kyle McCord all they want to. I'll say pump the brakes. Have you considered the O line play? Have you considered the receivers? Have you considered the defensive backs in the secondary that have played quite a bit? Like have you considered all of those things? And if you haven't, I would say look at that again and then maybe reassess how you view the quarterback, Kyle McCord. I think Kyle McCord needs work, which is no problem. But buddy, Mo, the O-line does too. Well, I'm going to say this. You de- deep diving into the O-line, first off, congratulations on you. I peeped that, but you dove into, like, the real problem. So congratulations on you for being a, <laughs> a, a, a real student of the game. <laughs> but I will say this, if all that that you said, think about it. We have concerns for the offensive line, right? But think about the five, six defensive linemen you named who we know make an impact in big games. Yes, sir. JT, Tua Maloa, Mike White. Like, like we can go, or I said Mike White. Wrong. Mike Hall. Anyway, yeah, Mike Hall. We could go down that line, right? But they've made impacts in big games against other opposing offensive linemen. So guess what our offensive linemen have the advantage of? That's who they're going in day. That's who they're going against day in and day out. And so for you to point out the cause for concern of the offensive line and for you to point out the elite play of the defensive line, we have an advantage that nobody else has. Yeah. Our offensive linemen are going to be practicing against the best defense, prop, arguably the best defensive line in the country, you know, day in and day out. So I'm not too concerned with the offensive line. It's fine. They don't look intact with April. It's, it's three of three new starters of the five. And I'm fine with that. That's cool. Like, I mean, we're sitting here watching, you know, Dewan Jones become like, could he be a top 10 pick? You know, like we're in that point in time where we're watching guys who used to play for Ohio State and we're like, he could be a top 10 pick. He's going to be sought after as far as the offensive lineman. And so he's so sought after for the simple fact, one, he's an amazing athlete, but two, he went against this same defensive line day in and day out. And so I'm looking at this offensive line and I think we're going to produce the same product. And I think come September, October, November, December, I think this offensive line is going to look a lot better because I think they're going to go into the games and know, like, I haven't faced the defensive line opposite me better than what I faced day in and day out. So I think confidence level is going to be at an all-time high for the offensive line of Ohio State when they go against pretty much everybody else because they know day in and day out I face the best defensive line. Let's keep it in more context, though, since that seems to be the thought that's in my mind in the word. Paris Johnson Jr. is viewed as one of, if not the best, pass-protecting offensive linemen in the upcoming draft. (laughs) And mode of what you just talked about, Tui Maloa was a guy that was going up against Paris Johnson Jr. in practice every day. If it wasn't Paris Johnson Jr., it was Zach Harrison. Now, Zach Harrison, I will tell you, he's not the best pass rusher, 
But that bad boy has some quickness and some length in the arms that yep. make Paris Johnson Jr. work at things that he might not be the best at. So if you have a Zach Harrison, if you have a Tony Maloa who you're going up against every day in practice and they're getting better and yep. they're making you work and you're getting better, I think that's a big reason why Paris Johnson Jr. is viewed as one of the, if not the best, pass-protecting offensive linemen, offensive tackles in the upcoming NFL draft. I'm going to get away from offense. I would say more if Traven Henderson played. He did not. I would. I, I liked what I saw from Chip Train. I mean, a little bit of down Hayden in the backfield. Yeah. Okay. I, I got. I can say this real quickly. I know. I'm, I know the show is moving pretty quickly with offense, and I, I. I love this a lot. But Mo, when it comes to this, the running backs, mine would have, if they could tackle him, and when he was out there, like I said earlier, the offense is different. Dallin mm-hmm. Hayden and Chip trained him when Chip trained him and broke that broke that long. I mean, it's, he weighed two thirty five, bro. He weighs two thirty five, and he broke that long run. And there was in a five, it was a five, a five yard gap between him and the nearest defender. Yeah. I think the backup situation at running back for Ohio State will be a whole lot better than I thought it would be. And then if you add Evan Pryor once he gets up, buddy, man, look, I'm comfortable <laughs> with Ohio State's running backs this year, man. I'm going to be honest, like I'm laughing with you breaking down the running backs because if there's one spot who we've never had to worry about, it's Ohio State running backs. Like, just think about it. You named what, four, five different names (laughs) and you're comfortable with any one of them. (laughs) You are comfortable with any one of them. Yes, sir. And that's I'm great with that. Like we've had elite running backs, especially at the college level. I don't care. When it comes to talking about Ohio State, whatever the guys go and do at the NFL level, I don't care. Like, I do, I root for them, but at the same time, like, but we have four or five different running backs, and we was in the same situation last year, and we pretty much have the same guys coming into this year. So, like, essentially, one of the most, what, you could say injury-prone positions. Man. We're so deep. It would take... You know, the ultimate strike of injuries for us to be worried about running back Mm -hmm. because we're that deep. So Mm -hmm. I'm with you on that. It's like Dallin Hayden, Mayan Williams, and shout out to Mayan Williams' mom. I just want to say that because um, at 1030, you know, Ohio State did like this pre-game thing and getting letting us get to know the players uh, prior to, you know, the uh, spring game. And Mayan Williams' mom was on there, and she's like, I always knew he was going to be what he is. And it's like, you know, they showed his high school highlights and all this, and I was like, well, she's valid for the simple fact. And that, that's why I say, like, watching it on TV, I was able to see certain things that you weren't because while you were pre-gaming and, and, and enjoying the time living up to the moment for the spring game, I'm watching things on TV, and Mayan Williams' mom knew he was always going to be this. And shout out to her because she was like, I never had a doubt. And for people who don't know this, because there might be, I learned this while watching this. Maya Williams was recruited to Ohio State for the simple fact his mother called Tony Alford and said, y'all have the best running back in the country in the state of Ohio. Why are y'all not recruiting him? Man. She called Tony Alford herself to get her son recruited because she's like, he's the number one running back in the state. He's an, he's one of the top running backs in the country, and y'all aren't recruiting him. And that's why Mayan Williams is now an Ohio State Buckeye. But when it comes to the running back position, like, I'm not concerned. That is the farthest of my concern because we're so deep. And it's weird, man. I, I, I have no problem, Mo, and part of the thing I do on Locked On, Buckeyes, if you're new to the, to the show and you're catching the first one, game week, weeks after games, Mo knows, Mo and I do shows, Jeff Hunt and I do shows, and people know I have no problem in season discussing things that I am disgruntled with or that might be a problem or a concern in season. Running back for me right now, for me to say it's not a problem, it's saying a lot. Because I understand quarterback, there's question marks. O-line, there's question marks. Really at tight end, I ain't worried about Kate Stover, bro. Like, I'm cool with Kate Stover. Receiver. Yeah, well, I'm pretty comfortable with Jaden Ballard based off of things that I have heard of late. I'm comfortable. Like I and if I if the if defensively, like I'll voice my concerns. Running back, and even people know last year, and Mo knows this very well. I voiced my opinion a yep. lot on this show about Travion Henderson. 
And I think last year, if he was healthy with no foot injury, I, I know I wouldn't have been as harsh on him. But two, I think that his issue a little bit with the vision would have been worked on because I still believe in the back of his mind he's wondering how healthy, what can I do with my foot? Mo, yeah. I'm cool with the running backs, man. But last thing is, was planning on being a whole total spring game react. We're gonna do more. We're gonna do all defense tomorrow. So, uh, if you guys want to hear more about my defensive reaction to the spring game, come back for tomorrow's show. But Mo, I got one statement about Marvin Harrison Jr. It's not about anything he caught out there. Any ball is simply this man on the football field. Mo Murphy, him walking out there, he looks like an NFL receiver. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that when you were out when you when you watched it out there, but I saw he it. looks like an NFL receiver right now. Yeah, and the thing is, you know, we we read about what scouts say. Like, had he gone into the NFL draft, he'd be a top five pick right now. But I will say, and Jay, I'd like to hear your thing on how you feel about this. Is that a cause for concern? Because is he going to give it his all? Week in, week out from September to hopefully mid-January, essentially trying to play for a national championship only because Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to be a top five pick next year. Is he going to show us that he's a top five pick week in and week out? Or is he going to just play the card and know that everybody knows his skill and he can kind of, a bad game is not going to be detrimental to him. Like, that's kind of my cause for concern with Marvin Harrison Jr. is are we going to get the best version of Marvin Harrison Jr. week in and week out? Or are we just going to get a going through the motions guy throughout the year? And essentially, if he has to come big, I think he will throughout the season. But I, I do have concern for Marvin Harrison Jr. Just for the simple fact, had this guy went in the draft this year, he'd be a top five pick. So I think it's a valid statement and a valid thought. And I do believe that in the present day of college football, you have to wonder, is he going to meld in a little bit? Is he going to be a player that's when, he out there, when he's out there? Is he going to just not be all that? Like, it, I'd say not be all that, but is he just going to, um, on the field, take plays off? Maybe not be on the sidelines, but maybe not block as hard. And, or maybe, yeah. maybe Mo literally. Week 10, game 10. Oh, he says I'm done for the season to prepare for the NFL draft. Like, these are legitimate things you have to think. And my gut tells me we won't have to worry about that with him. I believe that with the work ethic that he has, and honestly, just to be honest with you, I think his dad might steer him now, might steer him away from it. Because I think yeah. Marvin Harrison Sr., which I, man, I sound I, in my head. I sound old saying that. I watched this man play and kill for the Colts every Sunday. And yeah. now I'm watching his son on Ohio State kill every Saturday. It's insane. But anyways, oh. it, anyways, I, I think that that combo, because I, I know Marvin Harrison Sr. had a mad, crazy work ethic. Weight room-wise, he wasn't the biggest, strongest guy. But, you know, he, he stayed in shape. Weight, yeah. Well, workout-wise, um, on the field, him and Peyton Manning, I don't know how many – off-season workouts they did together, but I guarantee it was a lot because Peyton Manning stayed private, Marvin Harrison stayed private. So it probably wouldn't be hard for them to stay private and work out together. So mm -hmm. I, I think that his dad, I think it's to him, they're going to stay grounded. And also, Mo, is some added motivation that Harrison Jr. has, and it all happened. The game started New Year's Eve. It ended on New Year's Day. I think that loss to Georgia – is well that that loss of Georgia and him not winning the award for the best for being the best receiver in college football last year, the Blitnikoff. I think those a lot of those factors go into why I think he would not do that. Think about how tough that loss is, man. Like your Stroud plays a game, the best game he's ever played at Ohio State. You have all these things going well. Harrison Jr., I believe did he get not believe he got knocked out of the game. Yep. And you lose the game. And you're like, man, if I was out there, me, I think if I was him, if I was out there, we would have won the game. So I do think there are so many factors as to why my gut says I, Marvin Harrison Jr. will not do or just do what you described earlier. And I think he'll give us all every single week. We saw 
in Jigba in 2021. 96 no. catches, 1,606 receiving yards. Was it 15 touchdowns? Mm -hmm. I, Harrison Jr. is playing, possibly playing with this high school quarterback in Columbus. If there's a guy, Mo, that could break that record, any one of those records, any one of the three, it's Marvin Harrison Jr. this season. Because I do believe that chemistry that McCord and Harrison Jr. have ha had previously and still have now, if McCord is a starting quarterback, we can see more of that magic from a quarterback-receiver combination in the upcoming season. Yeah, and I don't, <clears throat> I don't disagree with you at all. Like, Jay, you've really been on point today. Like, <laughs> I can't disagree with you. And it's not like we jump on the show when I'm looking to disagree with you and play devil's advocate um, when it comes to talking about the Buckeyes. But I do think it's just a cause for concern as far it is, as it is. we know how good Marvin Harrison Jr. is. And it's playing devil's advocate. Like, had he go, went into the draft this year, this dude would be a top five pick. Like, yeah. and, and it's a fact. And, and GMs have said it. Like, we're not talking out of our butts right here. Like, we're saying what I'm just reiterating what GMs have said. Like, this dude would be a top five pick. They would, there's a possibility that people outside of Caleb Williams and maybe Drake May, people are going to be tanking for Marvin Harrison Jr., right. especially these teams who draft quarterbacks in this draft are going to be looking ahead to next year's draft and be like, we need Marvin Harrison Jr. to go with our young quarterback. And so I think, I don't know, and, and I love that the fact that he has his father, who's a potential Hall of Famer. Or Is Marvin Harrison Sr. a Hall of Famer? I Already? think he's in the Hall of Fame. I think so. Be. If not, he's potential, and we all would pitch for him to be in the Hall of Fame. But I, the, 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 the thing that I love is the fact that his dad is Marvin Harrison Sr., and at the end of the day, his dad knows what it takes to be great on all levels. And so I don't think he's going to let his son take any time off at the college level for the simple fact, like, the college level is going to make you great on the pro level. But I just, I have that slight concern for the fact, like, if Marvin Harrison Jr., because at the end of the day, he have all the tools with his dad, but at the same time, like, NIL money, this man going to make one, two, three million dollars and start to fill himself knowing he going to make five, 10, 15 million dollars in the next three to four years. Mo, two things. We're going to close up shop. One, Marvin Harrison Sr. is in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Went in it with the class of 2016. Okay. But you keep saying if he came out this year and Harrison Jr., he would possibly be a top five pick. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to give you my answer first. Turn it over, over to you really quickly, please. And then we're going to close up the show. Uh, Mo, my thought in my head who is the better football player? CJ Stroud, Marvin Harrison Jr. My vote goes to Harrison Jr., your answer, and then let the people know at the same time. Where they can follow you on Twitter and listen to your podcast. All right. So I'm going to answer your question. It's Marvin Harrison Jr. For the simple fact, there's a lot of thoughts about C.J. Stroud of what he can be. And for the simple fact, he put, you know, the green leafs on the side of his helmet. And there's questions about Ohio State quarterbacks. There's no question about Ohio State receivers. We just watched what Garrett Wilson did. Uh, did. We just watched what um, Chris Olave did. Nobody questions what Marvin Harrison Jr. look like in the NFL. There's certain questions about C.J. Stroud, which I think are unfair, but at the same time, he's an Ohio State quarterback. So I'm going to say Marvin Harrison Jr. is the better NFL prospect because he would go top five, no question, if he was in the draft right now. We don't know if C.J. Stroud will go top five. And on top of that, y'all can follow me at Mo underscore Cheese 15 on Twitter, at Up and Flames Pod on Instagram, and Jake. As always, I appreciate you for having me on Locked on Buckeyes. And guys, you can follow me on Twitter at jstevens07. Send all of your emails to jstevens317 at gmail.com. Today was reacting to the spring game with an Ohio State offensive point of view. Tomorrow's show will have a different tone to it. It's all about the defense. You don't want to miss it coming up. You don't want to miss tomorrow's show. It will be a lot of fun. Also, over the weekend, got a couple commitments tied in. Max LeBlanc, 
tight, committed to Ohio State, I believe at the start of the spring game, shortly after it kicked off. And then Sam Williams Dixon, running back in state product from the state of Ohio, he committed as well. The next time we get John Garcia Jr. on the show, hopefully that's later this weekend, or later this week, we'll try to discuss those things as well. More commitments to Ohio State. This recruiting class is looking to be a really good one, guys. We're out of here on a Monday. Hope you have a good day.